Whenever. All right, it's recording. Okay, uh, I have a brief topic. Uh, it's a it's a it's a new idea, but I I plan on um, probably presenting it again in more detail in the future. It's in some detail here. I have some slides, uh, but it's this is sort of a preview presentation just to kind of give you a snapshot of what I'm what I'm doing and kind of a a, a possibly cool idea. I'm still evaluating how much I like it, but it's it's new to me. It's like a new grid cell trick that that can um, that can do a thing that I didn't know it was possible. Uh, so, and it's not super complicated. I just didn't notice it before. So I'll go ahead and share this and I'll, uh, okay. Uh, you see it projecting, yes? Yes. I might assume yes. Um, so yeah, uh, just quick background. Um, I've been showing these ideas using 1D grid cell modules, using these arrays of 1D grid cell modules, also known as uh, arrays of oscillators. Uh, and there's really a, um, what's what's been keeping me excited about it is that I can explain a bunch of computational properties of grid cells like distortions, learned environments. And I've blasted them in the past, uh, and but I can explain them over in this world of 1D grids. And so the task, and if I want to really make a statement about neuroscience, I need to be able to explain it in terms of the 2D grid cells that are um, that are observed. And and I could, and as I've been saying from the beginning, there's a trivial way I can do it. The theory really does stand up. I can use the same ideas from here and just substitute two degree cell modules and it would work. Um, but I'm very cautious to do that because uh, an inconvenient background. Uh, so it's not clear that the brain actually performs readouts from multiple grid cell scales. If you look at it anatomically, those connections inconveniently don't seem to exist. Uh, and it, that's not conclusive. There's the, those studies haven't even been published yet. Like they're they're looking at it, but early signs are are that you can't just assume those connections are there, or at least you're putting your model at risk. Yeah, and we've talked Go about on. this before. Even even if even if they did exist, it doesn't seem to be enough of them, um, and they have problems because yes. the different scales don't work. So um, so we've we've yeah. been like if about they this did exist, I would be if they did exist. I, so I totally agree. If they did exist, I would try to still see what I could do with six to eight modules. But still, yes, it doesn't seem like there are very many of them. Um, yeah. And so this this idea of of um, a multi module grid cell mod, grid cell readout uh, in two D seems biologically implausible. You should, you can't just assume it's there. Uh, so so that brings up um, the second idea, uh, and th that I'm going to get into that um, th that what if both exist we've talked about this as well maybe for example the mini columns and cortex are 1d grid cell modules and 2d grid cells are some kind of readout of those um and in, in these slides i'm going to do a, some version of that uh so that's that's an appealing idea uh and and other models have um other models exist where you have a bunch of oscillators and 2D grid cells re are read out from those, but inconveniently, those other models that derive 2D grid cells from 1D oscillators don't preserve the representational capacity of the 1D oscillators. You can't just represent anything here. Uh, they kind of collapse onto a small set of combinations that are allowed. So and, just to re re reiterate, um, you're saying we lose, we lose all that extra information when you go to 2D cells, right? It's, it's, um, yeah. 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 So, um, so this is this is the kind of the background going into this, uh, and so in a, an appealing vision is uh, we've drawn versions of this before, but I'm just drawing this is the one I'm drawing today. Uh, an appealing vision is that the cortical sheet consists of you know a, a set of these 1D grid cell analogs or oscillators uh, that are then being read out by local grid cells. Uh, this picture is intended to look like the data tank paper. And uh, and and so you might have like multiple of these um, these readouts occurring within one module, and uh, so so this is just giving you a mental image. Now a more um, a more like theoretical vision, a theoretical um, like an information processing explanation of this would be um, at it's going to be a dimensionality expansion and a dimensionality reduction. As a as a um, as an animal moves through an environment, I didn't go ahead and draw this updating because that'd be that'd be very hard. But you 
what, what would happen is these 1D rings would all perform a bunch of their own updates. And they're actually representing something like that is representing what's out there. It's representing, you know, the boundaries, object vector cells and so on. Uh, and, but then somehow that gets reduced onto 2D grid cells where that follows that that where those behave as the 2D grid cells that we're familiar with that we see empirically. Uh, and so I, I'm trying to get something that does this. And so, so to look at this analytically, putting terminology, like precise terminology on this, I'm looking for a deterministic mapping from an N torus or N rings uh, that has high capacity onto a two torus, a two dimensional torus uh, that, and it's some kind of aggregate of, uh, of, of this code. Um, and the requirements of this, uh, there are ways to do this, but you, to, the, the requirements that it needs to meet are, um, it needs to be an unambiguous mapping such that given a point on the left, given the combination of where these dots are, there is a single correct position for the dot on the right. Uh, and the second requirement for it to behave like 2D grid cells is you can't have discontinuities. So smooth updating on the left should cause smooth updating on the right. Uh, you should never have this as the animal moves, this shouldn't just hop around. It should move smoothly. So um, to do this, I'm, I'm showing, now here's the new trick. Um, to yeah, show it- Marcus, uh, Marcus, yeah. wouldn't a 2D spatial pooler with topology give you those properties or no? I need to sit and think about this. Uh, <laughs> me too. <laughs> that's, that's putting me in a different mind space. Um, I'm imagining, you know, those are on the left, you have, you know, let's say mini column outputs and so you have pretty sparse high dimensional output coming in. And then you have a, just a random spatial pooler with topology, maybe not random, but spatial pooler with topology. So you have a 2D grid and sort of local inhibition radii and, and some, in, you know, sparsity so that you get very small uh, activity. I wonder if you would get something like that. You might, although I don't think it would. Although it I don't think, yeah, it, it, it wouldn't give you the. Do everything. It wouldn't move the dot in the two torus. You need something else to force the dot in the two torus to move uniformly. I think. Um, but that's why the topology would do that, wouldn't it? Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe not. I, maybe not. I, I don't uh, think about that. But it might be able to learn this mapping. Is what I'm wondering. Yeah. But okay. Well, why don't you continue? That was just a random thought. Yeah, what you're saying sounds like it would be grid-like. I'm not sure if it would be metric. Uh, so that, but maybe, yeah, that's a good avenue to think about. Uh, so, so the, the trick I'm going to show, um, to, to help think about it, I'm going to split the two torus into two rings. Uh, and now th I'm going to show just something really quite simple here. I just hadn't thought of it before. Uh, so I'm treating these rings. I'm drawing this almost like a neural network, um, where these rings are going to be de determined by, in some sense, adding these up, adding up some combination of them. And I'll say just in a little more detail what that, what I mean. So the rings on the right compute a sum of rings on the left. That's going to be confusing to you now. I need to get say more precisely, what do I mean by sum? Uh, it computes the sum of each ring's displacement from some reference point. So if you picture, may, maybe the reference point here is almost picture this like it's on the number line, like zero, 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 uh, the zero, this is the zero point on the ring. You take the displacement vectors from these zero points and add them up. Uh, this will give you a, another point on the ring. Uh, to be precise though, sometimes I compare grid cells to complex numbers. This is literally comp like complex number multiplication. Uh, for those of you who find that useful, is it, it well, well, maybe it, maybe it'll help explain something. I was just thinking, like, well, if if the dots on the ring on the end torus on the left are going around and round, and you think about a number line, and you're just adding it up, there would be a discontinuity when you go from zero to ten and back to zero again, or something like that. Uh, you know what I'm saying? If you, if you call it a number line, then how does it, you know, how does it wrap back on? I mean, I can imagine. Okay, I got zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But then I go back to zero. I know that's very simplistic, but that's what you said. So I'm just no, you're right. That's, that's the thing that I have to account for, um, and I do account for it. Kevin, what are you saying? 
yeah, th th this is a well-known technique uh, for adding angles. Uh, what you do is you add the X and Y components uh, and essentially find the centroid of, of those values and then uh, derive the angle off of that. So uh, since the, the points are confined to a, a 2D disk, typically uh, there's no discontinuity. So um, yeah, I've, I've used this technique in, in the past. Uh, so so I'm, I'm not following that, but it doesn't matter. Your point is that there may be techniques that we could do to make that work, to get around that problem. Right, I mean, if, if you decompose the angled X and Y components and separately average them, and yeah. then put them back in again, you get an angle result out of it. So that's, that's in essence what I'm seeing here. I need to study what you're talking about. I've, I, I don't know if we're talking about the same thing yet. It's, it's, yeah. it's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can dig up the reference. Well, let's, why don't we just go forward saying, okay, if somehow you got these, you got these values on the right and you're gonna somehow um, add them up <laughs> for each ring. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the adding the sum, um, the, if you think of these as having weights, the, well, you, first of all, you don't have to. You could think of these weights as being zero or one. Um, if you do weight the sum, the weights have to be whole numbers. And this is how you avoid discontinuities. Um, it, it, this may be like, you know, contorting your brain to think about this, may, but discontinuities are avoided by the fact that if you hold all of these rings constant, and this one makes a full cycle, this one must also make a full cycle, possibly multiple, but it needs to come back to its starting point. Hmm. Can I just- So that, now of course that's show, a contrived- When you show these toruses, it, am, should I interpret that, that there's a set of cells that are alternating activity and phase, or is, or is that the, that's, it's not that, it's just, it's just um, this is more conceptual, is that- Each, each of these is a 1D grid cell module. Or it's a velocity controlled oscillator. Okay, so uh, so well, a one-day grid cell module has multiple cells in it, right? Right. Yeah. It has, and so um, I, I don't know what it means to add up different cells, but if I call it a voltage controlled, yeah, you know what I'm saying? It's like okay, there's actually ten cells there. You're going to give a value to each one. Um, they're kind of equivalent. There's ten different cells. You're, in you're adding up the you're adding up the displacement from some. Oh, the cell. displacement. Okay, the displacement. Yes. Sorry about that. You did say that. And so um, the second, the second uh, requirement is, so it, this is basically the, what I just said. When a ring on the left makes a full circle, the ring on the right that it connects to also need to make a full circle. Um, and uh, that's a contrived scenario because in reality, you'll never just have one ring updating, but that's, that, is, that just helps you understand what would happen here. Uh, this, is, this is my last slide. This is me showing you a technique that will, that will work. I'm still, in the stages of following all of its, um, following every, well, figuring out everything that follows from this idea. Uh, and I can show neural mechanisms for it, but I'm still wrapping my head around it. I have spent time just sketching it out to myself. It works, it has all the properties you want. This, did, but did I'm, you, do you lose your, your you know, are you not losing your information when you go to the two Taurus now? Does that be somehow okay, preserved? Well, this, this certainly loses the information. However, the information is still here. The difference with the um, the other versions is that it's like an um, it's almost it almost like the other versions perform an error correction where once this collapses down onto the two torus, the other versions are going to then write back to this and lose all the information that's here. Hmm. Um, this isn't going to do that. Uh, it's 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 less of a error correction system and more of a almost almost like a fingerprint or checksum or hash system. So it's a, it's a mechanism for collapsing the higher dimensional n torus to a two torus. Yeah. Uh, that, that it's a mechanism that, that might work to do this. But yeah, doesn't, and, it doesn't, and, and, doesn't solve some of the problems with the two torus, but it, um, uh, or does it, I think, I think you said not yet. Like we still I'd say the problem of this solves, the problem this solves is right now I have a really nice theory of grid cells that lives in this land. Yeah. And now this was the missing piece that now I have a really nice theory of grid cells that lives in this land. If we assume I'm right about this middle piece, okay. which, is, which I'm not assuming yet. And I, I would say I haven't even given you a, that good of a pitch for it yet. Once I understand it more fully, I'll be able to just like just have it in the right way where it clicks and feels right. 
if it's right. Uh, and uh, so I'm still, this was the snapshot presentation, the new grid cell trick of adding angles, causing a collapse from a high dimensional torus to a low dimensional torus. So uh, in a second, I'm going to talk about, it's, it's amazing how much overlap is between what you present here, not in what your new idea is, but in the same problem I'm trying to solve uh, in some ways. Um, I didn't phrase it the way, but the, the, this can be there's somewhat overlap between what you just talked about, what I'm going to talk about, but I'm coming out in a completely different direction. So, uh, so it's interesting. I'm trying to get my head around it, um, but it'll be good cross fertilization here. So it's so a dumb question. Why do we need the two torus? What benefit uh, is there to the two torus? That's a good question. Uh, I would, I, I'm, I guess, I'm trying to figure that out. I mean, the, the reason we need it is because grid cells exist, and I'm trying to explain them. And um, and so, yeah, the theoretical reason for them it seems to be that that what entorhinal cortex is passing up to the hippocampus is some unique memory footprint or fingerprint <laughs> footprint, uh, some unique memory oh, okay. fingerprint. So Okay, so the two D, the two torus will encode the, um, will have the representation, the predictive representation that you've been speaking about in the past, and that would be difficult to do in the in the rings in the one D. Like no, what I'm real, what I really think is like I can explain what's going on down here is what I've been talking about is down here. Oh, I'd okay. say an open question is. Why do these exist, and why does yeah, why do we care about? So them? I I can give you an answer why they exist. Uh, it's made not the right answer, but it's an answer. Um, you know, one of the things uh, is that we also know from biology is that you know when you're moving, these oscillators go, and their voltage control, meaning their their speed control, the oscillators, right? So you, it's a theta frequency, and it increases a little bit based on how fast you're moving, um, and. The uh, but as soon as you stop moving, that all that goes away. Um, the theta rhythm stops and everything stops. You need something. One of the things you need is the ability to uh, uh, latch on to your current location and hold it. You know, you don't forget where you are as soon as you stop moving. And um, we also need it. So that's one of the things you might get from having a 2D. Um, Torus for the, the 2D grid cells. You have, so the, that, you, have, you have the center surround inhibition, which locks these guys in and holds them in place. And also, by the way, uh, it, forces, it enforces smooth movement of the, of the active cells as you move. Um, so, well, the bottom one also has smooth movement, doesn't it? But um, it stops. Uh, <laughs> right? Yeah, it stops. Uh, and that seems like more like a physical limitation or like an implementation thing, like because of the biophysics of the way these things are implemented, perhaps, perhaps it you is. might need it. It may not be a fundamental. Yeah, effect. maybe not. But but the way I've been thinking about it is like, okay, well, this, this is the hybrid model. Remember we talked about the hybrid grid cell model and um, like, oh yeah, it's, all, it's, 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 uh, uh, it's oscillation interference or that's what, oscillatory interference models. And we, we also have this, um, um, you know, center surround inhibition and, and maybe the center surround inhibition is just there to, to lock in the results <laughs> until time until you start moving again. Uh, at least that's one of the things it does. And whether that's fun, whether that's uh, theoretically essential or not is a question, right? But it is certain, as, as Marcus says, it's, it's there. We see these, that's what grid cells look like, right? Yeah, it's it's totally a valid question. I, I don't I don't understand what because because the theory Jeff just gave, on the other hand. When the animal stops moving, grid cells also stop firing. Was that right? I and thought they continued to fire. Is that wrong? I'd say wrong? the only cell that reliably does that is head direction cells. Grid oh. cells, if you just watch a video of a rat walking around, grid cells will just totally stop firing. Oh, and then, I didn't and then know that. it fires, moves, and then oh. for the most part, they don't fire when the animal stays. So. Interesting. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, so the, the thing I worked through, the theoretical thing I worked through, was that I wanted this property that if if the agent moves in something that's kind of square shaped, that um, that the grid cells would also move in something square shaped, while the intermediate representation still has all the properties we want, like high capacity, not wrapping around on itself. And basically, to summarize, it works. Uh, and that that's what I that's one of the big questions I had once I, after I thought about this on Monday. Uh, so that's that is the 
the one thing I've worked through on this, but I've still, I still have work ahead. This is, this was like a preview presentation. There's also a chance next time I'll tell you that, uh, that it's just too implausible. I haven't decided yet. All right. And that's it for my part. I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Great. Um, so I've been working on the same, we're all working on the same problem, at least those of us working on this. And so I've been trying to, I've been trying to not only figure out how the quarter of a column implements grid cells, but I've been trying to figure out how it implements displacement cells. Because I'm, I'm kind of working through a theory where I can get the whole, I mean, remember in the end, what we, we think is going on is that object models of objects are objects at relative locations and orientations to other objects, which are relative locations and orientations to other objects. And we had this concept of displacement cells. So I'm working on the idea of how grid cells and displacement cells can be all implemented in a cortical column. And, um, and the displacement cells have to have displacement for orientation as well as displacement for, for location. So and I'm just, and, and so it's really a lot to ask a cortical column to do. There's just, there's a lot of things that have to happen and it, it just doesn't seem to be enough cell types. And I'm, I'm, you know, I've been really trying to struggle with it. So I went back to an idea, you know, I'll tell you in a second, um, uh, which is the idea that actually the, um, uh, the grid cells come about because there's oscillations in the individual uh, dendrites. This is a, uh, I'll, I'll mention that again, that was a paper that Mirko reviewed when he was here. So let me just go through, um, this, is, this is overlapping with what Marcus just said, but here's my notes on my notepad here. Um, if we're gonna make a grid cell, uh, we have to first of all determine the, the velocity of movement in multiple directions. All the oscillatory intermediate models require this. Um, so, we, and they're one dimensional uh, directions. Um, and so that's something that has to be done. Um, then we have to convert that velocity, which is a scalar, um, into a, uh, using a VCO into an oscillation change. So we, now we're gonna have some sort of oscillator that's running around theta, but when we're moving in a particular direction a certain amount, the faster we move in that direction, the faster that rhythm goes above the base theta. So now we have a base theta and we have this faster one which represents movement in particular directions. Um, and it's, in, it's the interference between the base theta and the in, uh, incrementally faster theta which, which cause, um, a causes a, a beating effect which is really the basis of grid cells. But then if we're gonna do, um, if we're gonna do a, a grid cell module for each of the voltage controlled oscillators we have to have a set of cells or a set of oscillators. That's number three here. Uh, I say for each VCO, we need a set of VCOs. It's actually a set of sub VCOs, if you will, but or that that they have the same incremented frequency but have different phases, because the way that we're going to get one grid cell module to fire one location, another grid cell follow next to it is that they have to be looking at the same voltage control oscillators, but at different phases of the voltage controlled oscillators. So there's been proposals on how that happens. Um, and uh, we also, with something we haven't really discussed much, we need a way of, of anchoring grid cells. I don't, I don't have this written here. Uh, that's down here, I guess. Um, uh, um, I can, I, I'll get to it, but, but basically we need a way of anchoring grid cells on diff different environmental conditions. So when we go into an environment, we immediately anchor our grid cells um, and that's another requirement. So let me just go down to this up here to this. This is gonna be very quick. These are only two pictures here. Look at this one in the middle here, this thing. Uh, this is a cell, I'm showing six dendrites on it. And there was a paper, I don't remember the authors or the title of the paper, but if someone has it and sent, could send it on Slack, that'd be great, because I wanna read it again. But in this paper that Mirko reviewed, um, the idea was that individual dendrites have their own oscillations. And, um, and that the individual dendrites oscillated uh, differentially in, um, in different directions of movement. So let's say this dendrite here would go from one direction and this would go another direction, and this would go another direction, um, that they would sum at the cell body and you'd get the oscillatory inference happening here. So um, I show six here, because one of the complications of, of this whole system is we know that uh, these, these voltage control oscillators only work in one direction. So, when I measure movement in north and then I head south, it's, it's not like the, the one oscillator goes faster then it goes slower. It doesn't appear to be that way. It appears to be like if you go north, you get one oscillator that goes faster and south, you get a different oscillator that goes faster. So that these are, these are not, um, these are unidirectional oscillators in some sense. 
Um, so this idea was, uh, when Merkel read this paper, I was kind of like incredulous about it. I was like, I never heard of these, voltage, these oscillations and dendrites. It seemed kind of like a complicated system. How is this going to work? But maybe for those of you who've been around a while, you remember that paper, hopefully, that Merkel presented. It was, it was an alternate. Um, it was basically saying that these oscillators are not cells. There is because there, there are other models where the oscillators are representing cells, and each cell is at a different phase in the oscillation. But this is like no, it's the it's the dendrites themselves. So now recall, and Marcus just mentioned this, and I've been proposing that the mini columns themselves, because of the complex cells in them, look like they would represent a movement vector in a one D dimension. Each each mini, each mini column looks like that. That's what the complex cells look like. They're doing. They're saying. I'm going to be active when I'm moving in a, one direction. And if I'm moving a bit off, I'm a little bit less active. And I'm moving orthogonal and not active at all. Now, I asked myself, imagine we're going to take this idea of the, the voltage dendrites, um, the, the oscillatory dendrites. And now here's a, here's a cell with a more realistic set of um, dendritic arbors. There's actually a lot more branches than I'm showing here. And I've shown these blue circles just sort of um, as placeholders for the, the surrounding mini columns that this dendritic tree would go through. Dendritic, uh, mem remember, mini columns are pretty small. They can be anywhere from 30 microns to 80 microns or something like that. So dendritic arbors are typically much larger than that. And so um, the dendritic arbor of this cell here would be, uh, would be uh, it, it, it coursing through all a bunch of mini columns nearby. In fact, most of them. <laughs> um, it doesn't mean it's connecting to them, but it's coursing through them. Now imagine if each of these mini columns was a uh, essentially a voltage controlled oscillator. Um, and imagine that for various possible mechanisms that they are, they are essentially uh, creating each dendritic branch to be a voltage controlled oscillator um, uh, or, or a, a, you know, yes, that's basically what it is. As opposed to the, the, the picture down here, where I showed six of them, or in that paper, they showed three of them. Um, imagine now that all these dendritic branches are essentially picking up the oscillation of the local, the mini column that's, that they're coursing through. And so now you have a cell essentially has the ability to, um, to aggregate lots of different movement commands um, um, that, were, that, that it would use. Now, at any particular point in time, most of these mini columns would be inactive. It's, you know, if I have, if you look at like, you know, like a typical picture, like uh, from from back in the day, of cats and so on, that you know, you might see ten different mini columns representing ten different movement vectors, and one and a half or two would be active at once, that kind of thing. But we, this can be a lot more complicated than that. And these these voltage control oscillators could be all kinds of dimensions, not just you know two dimensions, not just the dimensions of, of two dimensions in a rat's maze, but they could be any number of dimensions. Um, that, um, that the system could be modeling three dimensions or more or just one dimension. And uh, at any point in time, some set of these mini columns will be active, some small set will be active, and then those dendritic branches would be um, uh, depolarized. And you could, get this, you could get this oscillatory interference happening at every, in some sense, all, any junction along the, um, any section of these dendrites or any junction of these dendrites, you could be having the same kind of effect that you have down here. Um, and, um, and so this is a way of merging, sort of bringing the oscillatory interference idea of the mini column, or excuse me, the voltage control oscillator for dimensional movement, the mini column, uniting with this idea, but just making it a lot more complicated. But it also be a very physical thing. It just, it, it just would naturally occur um, as these dendrites course through whether, it, whether there's a, like, a, you know, the, it could be, for example, it could be like a bipolar cell, which is very constrained to a minicom. That's a cell that's very constrained to a minicom. Could be forming synapses on these dendrites saying, you should be, you should be locked in synchronization with me. I'm a minicom, this blue circle. I'm oscillating. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you oscillate with me. It could be a local field effect or it could be a, a dendritic effect. I don't know. But the I idea think the is dendritic that, segments would automatically tend to pick up on things on, on uh, synapses that activate concurrently because it, 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 they have to activate within a few milliseconds in order to get a dendritic spike yeah. anyway. So. But you're, but I'm not even, I'm not, a, I'm not, a, this doesn't, doesn't require that there actually has to be synapses here. I'm going to get to the synapses in a moment. The most important thing right now is that the dendritic segment is oscillating in its, it, along with the mini column. 
And it could be because our synapses on here that are, that are firing, um, that are coming from the main column, or it could be, it doesn't have to be that way. Because I'm going to talk about the purposes of these, there's going to be other synapses here I'm going to use for something else in a moment here. So you're treating um, them as antennas? Uh, that, maybe that's great, Kevin. That's how you would think about them. But, uh, well, I, I, yeah. potentials, you know. Yeah, I, I just say you've got this thing. Uh, yeah, it's local field. I guess like an antenna, yes. I guess I wouldn't have thought of it that way. Yes, it would be, be like an antenna. Yes, it's a good analogy. <laughs> it just makes me laugh. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, like little antennas. So it could be because of synapses that are forming and those synapses, if they, if they were, then those, those synapses would have to come in cells that are only in this mini column, which is why I suggested it might be the bipolar cells because they were constrained, those little very fine constrained uh, dent, um, axons that are within the mini column. Uh, or it could be just a local field potential antenna, as Kevin says. Um, but the, that's the basic idea. And um, I'm working through it. Um, but here's what, here's what you get with this. You get a whole nother level of abstraction, a whole nother level of the, the, what's driving this grid cell under many, many different contexts. For example, going back to the issue that grid cells have to anchor, right? Remember when you go in an environment, they have to somehow know I'm supposed to be active. And, and we, we haven't really talked about, you know, given some environmental input, you know, how that occurs. Um, in this case, uh, as is, let's say this cell has been, it's going along and some of these segments are active and then another, some other segments are active. Um, it can learn to associate um, a pattern of, it can learn to form 20 to 30 synapses here, which say under this particular context, um, that's the pattern I'm seeing in the world. And under a different, you know, and even that segment could be shared of other different patterns. It, it, it basically allows that the, it allows me to lock in a set of um, dendritic activations and which essentially it locks in this cell's activity under many, many, many different contexts. Um, I'm not saying what those contexts are in a moment. I, I want them to be um, objects at some pose or you know, orientation and distance from, um, from the observer. observer. But, but for the moment, it just it allows me to give me a mechanism like we have, it's, we've, we've sort of another level of indirection where, we're, where the grid cell is actually the sum it's, it's a representing, it's the same thing that Marcus was doing. I want this grid cell to represent a, a much more complex set of interactions that are going out there that all kind of go on to the cell being active. Um, and so that's what this does. It, it, and, and so um, that's pretty much the idea that I'm working on right now. Um, and what I like about it too, is it, it, it just naturally incorporates the local, uh, it, it's a physical mechanism where the physical proximity of the dendrite to the mini columns it's passing by causes the oscillations on these um, dendrites. I remember when Merkel presented this paper, I was like, how do these oscillations come about and who sets them? And where, you know, it was like- You mean Florian? Like, was it Florian who did it? I thought it was Merco. Was it Florian? Oh, you was Florian. I'm sorry about that. Sorry, been. Florian, if you're listening to this. Sorry, Merco, if you're listening to this. It was Florian, I'm sorry. Yes, Florian presented that paper. God, stupid me. Um, yeah, Florian did. Sorry about that. Um, I was just so kind of looking up, thinking about mechanisms again. And one other possible mechanism is to look at gap junctions that are in pyramidal neurons. And they may be, perhaps the, they're formed by these bipolar cells. I'm not sure. But yeah. uh, I was just doing a little bit of searching. And there, there's a whole, there's a review paper on gap junctions in pyramidal neurons and how they lead to oscillations of different types in the membrane potential. Um, uh, all right. so that think, seems to be important for according to yeah. them binding memory and all that stuff. So, so again, I'm going to pass on the actual mechanism by which it occurs. But when Florian presented this paper, I was like, well, who's going to decide what these oscillations are? Where are they coming from? I know what they have to represent, but like how? But this tells me how. This tells me, and it tells me it's doing on a branch by branch base or, you know, something that's if, if I think of a mini column of this, say 50 microns wide, it's going to happen on a 50 micron section of dendrite. If it's an 80 micron mini column, you have an 80 micron section of dendrite. Um, so it just takes this idea, expands it, and, and it also um, it tells me where these oscillations are coming from. They're coming from the mini columns, <laughs> so which is which is really beautiful a result. Um, it also is interesting. I thought I thought it's an interesting thought too that. Um, 
um, there's a couple other complications here. First of all, adjacent many adjacent grid cells have to have um, you know they have they're not identical, and so uh, you need them to you know essentially what happens is the the oscillation on this let's say the oscillation on in here the oscillation on this dendrite here is going to be I have to have another oscillation on the next cells the next grid cell over it has to be able to get a similar oscillation but a, from the same maybe mini column but a different phase right it has to be a different phase I mean so a voltage controlled oscillator has to have cells in multiple phases um, to get multiple grid cells in a grid cell module that was that's part of the theory so what that tells me there is like okay that means if I'm looking at a mini column like this mini column and the mini columns oscillating at this theta plus frequency because we're moving in its direction I have to have multiple cells within the mini column that are that are cycling through their phase, or I just have, or at least I have to have different. I have to have somehow in that mini column. I have to represent the different phases of that oscillation, whether it's a cell firing or if it's traveling oscillation that goes down the mini column. I don't know what it is, um, but there has to be multiple uh, phases represented so that the next cell over might also pick it up, but would pick up at a different phase. Um, and I've been, I just started to work through the learning mechanisms for this, but I think this whole thing could be learned. That is, if we force two grid cells next to each other, if we, if we force a bunch of grid cells into a 2D um, uh, center surround type of inhibitory network, so that we're forcing this pattern we see of grid cells in a module where multiple cells are spaced out and so on, um, that um, you could, I think, it's, I haven't worked it through yet, but I think you could get it to, to force the next cell over to form synapses with the form synapses uh, or, or, or connect to a different part of the minicom for different phase, because that's what's required to go from one grid cell to the next. So this, this guy has to be looking at the next set of phases um, and so on. Anyway, that's the idea. Um, I, I have a really good feeling about this, uh, although there's many things that are unknown. It, it just all of a sudden gives me this whole additional tool of indirection, another level of complexity that we can work with. And it ties in something I've been trying to do for ages, trying to figure out the physical structure of many columns um, and how they relate to, to behavior. Um, so anyway, that's the idea. More qu questions or comments? Otherwise, I'll just try to go further with it. So just making sure I have the mental image of just the basic building block of this, the VCO. Um, are you picturing them as it's just constantly oscillating over time? There's just almost a bump of activity moving through the mini column constantly. And when the animal speeds while, up, it goes. While, while that animal is moving in that direction. Uh, OK. So is there, is there a base frequency? The base frequency is theta, right? And that's, that's that I didn't show that here. But that I've always thought that it would be coming out in the apical dendrites, so that um, the thalamus would be projecting theta um, across the broad area of cortex, right? Um, because the base theta doesn't change. So somehow the thalamus is projecting a base theta across, um, let's say, all the apical dendrites for these cells. So the cell is looking at the soma of the cell is getting a base theta from its apical dendrite, and it's getting the um, um, it's getting the sum of the, um, or, or no, I guess, yeah, I, I, you know, I haven't worked through that. Does the base data have to be presented at each dendritic junction or can I just do it at the sum? Um, I don't know. Is that the question you're heading towards, Marcus? Well, I, I'm just, so a VCO, the most basic form of it, is basically always spiking, and it's just it's spiking at some base rate, uh, and it speeds up when movement, you know, aligns with its selected velocity and slows down otherwise. Uh, I thought I thought that wasn't the case. I thought for the, I thought for the 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 voltage control oscillators that they only, I can't even remember what the evidence for this was, but I, I had the impression they only only become active when you're moving, and when you stop moving, they just they just either silent. Um, they don't have to keep moving. They're, they're not, and and it doesn't matter. And I guess it doesn't really matter for me if if it's if the oscillator, if the if the base oscill, if if um if um if say I'm not moving in this dimension, if I'm not moving in a dimension, um, 
is if the oscillation of the VC, of the VCO was exactly theta, then it wouldn't have any wouldn't make any contributory effect. It would just be theta, and so it'd be as if it was nothing. Um, it's only it's only the only important thing about it is when it speeds up relative to theta. Uh, I think we talked about this once. Whether it didn't matter whether the the base if whether it kept oscillating or if it stopped oscillating would achieve the same result. So that that part's true. It, that part's true in the fact that it works no matter what the base uh, frequency is, even if the base frequency is zero. Uh, so yes, that that is true. But you make things if you were recording recording the neurons. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, this is, is this, this is a germ of an idea. It's even less of a germ of an idea that you presented, Mark. So, um, um, but it just it just feels really good. Like, okay, it solves a bunch of problems, and and, and now there's a lot of questions about it still, a lot. Uh, um, but um, I'm I'm hoping, as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm I'm also you know what we really need the system to do is. We really needed to calculate displacements. <laughs> That's what we needed to do, and um, and uh, and we need to do that really quickly in the in a column. And we need to be able to storing displacements. You know, the, the theory we started off publishing the thousand brain theories that we had these locations and features at locations, and then we said that's not going to work. We need to you know it's got to be objects at locations or objects. And so that's where the displacement idea came from, and I'm sure that's right. And so. Um, I, I'm hoping this is going to give me a, an avenue for figuring out how to calculate displacements using some, because I've been struggling with that greatly. Like how it is I can actually calculate a displacement um, from, you know, a grid cell. Um, I'm not sure yet, but I'm hoping this, this gives me a whole new toolkit to work with to figure, maybe figure that out. Uh, you know, for example, we remember layer six cells, they, they send their dendrites up into layer four. Not only do they project to layer four, but they send their dendrites up into layer four. So, um, so you might be, and so you might be getting on, on, a, on a dendritic branch or a dendrit, dendritic tree of a particular grid cell, if you will. Um, you might be getting some of it is going to be getting input that represents one thing, and some of it's going to represent inputs in another thing. So, what what if one of them represented movement in um, in the object space and one of them represents movement ego and allo spaces or something like that you know so it just gives me a tool that would to start thinking about these ideas any other questions marcus anyone else i have i have a very basic one um the um do we know what makes a dendrite decide to branch is it just you know it wants to reach other uh axons or is there something that goads the behavior for it to actually branch? Um, I don't know if anyone else knows the answer to that question. I know, I know only a little bit about it. Um, um, I know that's I, been studied a lot. Um, has it? Okay. A, a fair amount. I, I think you kind of, if you're going to fill a 3D volume where you know you have axons coming in, you kind of have to branch. Um, yeah, I th I, it's sort of the most, in some ways, it's the most efficient way to reach possible synapses in a, in a 3D volume. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's the result. I'm just wondering, you know, what actually induces it to feel that it needs to go in that particular direction. I mean, it's... well, I do know, I do know that in some neurons, and so I don't know all neurons, but in some neurons, the tips of the dendrites, uh, just like the tips of the axons, uh, can grow uh, all the time. They're constantly reaching out, trying to find new connections, and they will retract. So if they don't find anything useful, they retract, and they'll try growing in a different direction. Um, oh, okay. But you can, I can see what Subutai is saying. You can easily imagine there might be some really stupid algorithm that just says, you know, if I've gone a certain distance, um, I should fork because that's going to be an efficient way of getting finding more things. You know, it's, it's like trees, right? You know, when does a tree decide to branch? It's it's yeah, I mean, and, and kind of what you're saying, if it's somehow following gradients of activity around it and it's trying to make connections, it kind yeah. of has to branch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you can you can think of like a tree too. If a tree makes a little branch and the, and the puts a few leaves out there and there's no sunlight on them, it's just going to wither away. But if it but if it's getting good sun, it'll continue to grow. Well, um, the reason why I mention it is that, you know, you know, I would think that there's, you know, one thing is, you know, some kind of chemotaxis, but if you're talking now about local field potentials, 
that might be an additional inducement just well there, there's just... there's definitely there's um well, there's a couple of things here first of all when the when the brain is developing you know in, in utero even after utero um there are gradients that say oh i'm supposed to send this neuron is supposed to move over to here and this neuron is going to send its axon up to here um so there's these basic wiring that occurs but as far as we know, all the end result wiring, all the individual synapses, almost all of those are, are um, you know, are, are not encoded in genes. Uh, much much of it's learned, and um, and there is a there's a lot of literature about. Uh, remember, we've talked about the astrocytes, um, um, the the other cells in the neocortex um, that that they help. Uh, astrocytes is that the right word? Am I, am I getting confused again? Um, all right. Well, this is other non these other non non neurons that um, that will will guide a dendrite and an axon together based on um, on activity. So there's some there's some assistance going on about where a neuron should grow.